So we're all good. Welcome everyone to uh, CSSR webinar. Um, I will be your host and uh, webmaster today. Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Garrow. Um, I'm from Treaty 6, Métis Homeland, living in, Al in Alberta, Edmonton, Alberta. And I'm from Batoche, Saskatchewan, which is fantastic, close to where Don is. Um, I, I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Native Studies, newly minted, which is really fun. Um, and so today we are talking with Dr. Don Schweitzer from St. Andrews College on a, a webinar for the CSSR for the Canadian Society for the Study of Religion, our webinar series, which is organized by uh, Sarah, uh, uh, Sarah, her amazing Sarah Wilkins Laflamme. Um, so the title of his work today is called Honoring the Declaration, a collaboration, something that me and Don worked on with a really amazing group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars looking at religion and, uh, and looking at UNDRIP, so the United Declaration of Indigenous Peoples. So um, in terms of just how we're going to proceed, I will shut off my camera and it'll be focusing on Don um, or Dr. Schweitzer. And uh, what I will do is be open to any questions or comments that you have in, in the chat. So please pay attention, <laughs> pay attention, uh, enjoy the the wisdom of uh, dr schweitzer and put in your comments there so we'll we'll work for about 45 50 minutes or 30 30 35 40 minutes and we'll have a q a at the end all right so without further ado thank you and welcome dr schweitzer all right well thank you let me begin by first acknowledging that i also speak to you today from treaty six territory in the homeland of the metis I pay respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm my relationship with them. Second, I thank Paul for the invitation to speak to you about the book project that he and I were timekeepers and editors for. The book is entitled Honoring the Declaration, Church Commitments to Reconciliation, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It, was, it is published by the University of Regina Press, I'll talk about how the book came to be, then give an overview of its chapters, and then expand a little on its topic. The book provides academic resources to help the United Church of Canada and other denominations fulfill their commitment to the UN Declaration as a framework for reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. With the passage of Bill C-15 and the re-election of a Liberal minority government, the topic of the Declaration as a framework for reconciliation between settlers and Indigenous peoples has taken on great importance. Hopefully this book will also be relevant for this broader discussion. The book had its beginning on March 30th, 2016, when seven Canadian churches, United Church among them, announced that they had adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation between themselves and Indigenous peoples in compliance with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number 48. At the time, I was reading Blood and Ink by Robert LaSalle Klein, an account of the Jesuit martyrs of the University of Central America. It tells of how they decided to dedicate their scholarship and the life of the university to the service of the people of El Salvador. The university's mission of research was to be subordinated to what the poor majorities of El Salvador objectively needed. Reading about this, in conjunction with receiving the church's announcement, led me to wonder if the faculty of St. Andrews College could do something similar. Adopting the declaration as a framework for reconciliation is a far reaching enterprise. It will require all the resources Canadian churches can muster. Following the example of these Jesuits, could we as a faculty dedicate our work to providing an academic resource to help our church and others fulfill this commitment? This idea was broached at a faculty meeting in May, 2016. The faculty of St. Andrews College then were all settlers, five white and one Korean. All were committed to reconciliation on some level, but initially the response was lukewarm. There were probably various reasons for this. One was a sense of caution. This work needed to be done carefully and was not to be lightly entered into. We'd never done anything like this before as a faculty, so people needed time to think about it. 
On a personal note, for me, there was trepidation. I've been trained to focus on my research and not be distracted by current events. The idea of working on the church's adoption of the declaration seemed at first an interruption of my already busy schedule. As Sandra Beardsall notes in the book's introduction, adopting the declaration as a framework for reconciliation will involve acts of personal and intellectual repentance for many settlers. For my part, turning from other projects to working on the book did involve some of this. Though initial responses to the idea were mixed, discussion about it continued, excitement built, and all the faculty got on board. In October 2016, we agreed to do it. Each of us would address United Church's adoption of the Declaration as a framework for reconciliation from our own academic discipline, be it ethics, church history, biblical studies, preaching and worship, or theology. A second key step occurred as we realized that work towards reconciliation is not something settlers can do on their own. While settlers must undertake their own decolonization, this needs to be done in dialogue with Indigenous peoples. Settlers cannot unilaterally establish parameters and procedures for this. Also, reconciliation involves building relationships. We realized that we needed to invite Indigenous scholars to collaborate with us and decided to hold a symposium to enable this. Funding was received from the United Church and invitations sent out to Indigenous scholars. On November 23rd and 24th, 2017, they and we gathered at St. Andrews to discuss what each proposed to contribute. At this point, the book ceased to be a project of St. Andrews College faculty. It became instead a collaboration between ourselves, Indigenous scholars, and a group of Indigenous and settler activists in Saskatoon, known as Iskawewak i Wichi Witochik, Women Walking Together. The idea of producing an academic resource to help the United Church and other denominations fulfill their commitment to the Declaration remained, but the ethos and working style of the group changed. Participants gathered in a circle during the symposium. We were fortunate to have Sackage Henderson as part of our group. He's been a research fellow with the Native Law Center at the University of Saskatchewan since 1993. Prior to that, he spent over two decades as a strategist working to create Indigenous diplomacy in the United Nations system, and then in the drafting team and working groups that framed the declaration and eventually got it adopted by the UN. He agreed to participate and during the symposium was recognized as the elder for our gathering. The group rejected the hierarchical notion of an editor who would have authority over others and vet their contributions. Instead, Paul and I were appointed as timekeepers, charged with keeping the project moving to fruition. In the following months, contributors worked in pairs, discussing each other's work. Eventually, the manuscript was complete, and we sought out the University of Regina Press as a publisher, partly because of their location in Treaty 4 territory. This book was to be a response to the church's commitment from the Prairie region. The title was originally suggested for the book was Honorable Reconciliation. However, in the course of the book's production, the term reconciliation became contentious in discussion across Canada. Some Indigenous people criticized it as a new term for assimilation. This critique reflects a distinction between a liberal model of reconciliation, focusing on soft Indigenous rights that seeks to accommodate Indigenous peoples with minimal changes to current Canadian political, legal, and economic structures and ways to perpetuate colonialism versus an understanding of reconciliation is centered on Indigenous self-determination, reparations, and support for land-based ways of life that requires transformation of Canadian society. There is some ambiguity in the declaration on this point. It strongly affirms Indigenous self-determination and other hard rights. However, Article 46 stipulates that nothing in the declaration may be interpreted as the affirming the right of any people, group, or person to act in a way that would disrupt the territorial integrity and unity of nation states. This could be read as limiting the right of Indigenous peoples to self-determination. 
Still, the TRC emphatically understood reconciliation as requiring transformative change for Canadian society and put implementation of the declaration in its calls to action as a guide towards this. While some authors in this book do not use the term reconciliation, all understand the declaration in this sense as fundamentally affirming the right of Indigenous peoples to self-determination and as requiring reparations and the support and protection of Indigenous peoples' land-based ways of life. The book begins with a foreword by Paul Garot and myself, explaining some of its terms and our role in its production. Next is an introduction, collectively written by Sandra Beardsall, then Professor of Church History and Ecumenics at St. Anne's College, Sackage Henderson, and myself. It gives an overview of the book's context and intention, a brief history of the Indigenous struggle leading to the formulation of the Declaration, and an account of how the book came to be. Following this are introductions to each author and chapter overviews. The first chapter by Sackage Henderson is entitled The Indigenous Imperative. It discusses how the adoption of the Declaration involves a far-reaching and multifaceted recognition of the inherent dignity of Indigenous peoples and offers directions as to how this should be implemented in seminaries and elsewhere. The second chapter by Christine Mitchell, then Professor of Hebrew Scriptures at St. Andrews, looks at the responsibility biblical scholars and churches have to deal with biblical passages that support colonial practices. Chapter three by Lynn Caldwell, Professor of Church and Society at St. Andrews, looks at how education about the need for reconciliation and the changed consciousness this may bring cannot take the place of concrete changes to colonial social structures and personal relations. The fourth chapter is by Adrian Jacobs, Keeper of the Circle at the Sandy Soto Spiritual Center at Beauséjour, Manitoba on Treaty 4 territory. It recounts aspects of colonial history in Canada and the United Church, the rise of self-government for Indigenous people within the United Church, and what its commitment to the Declaration will require. Sandra Beardsall's chapter examines an earlier attempt by the United Church to be in solidarity with Indigenous peoples through involvement with Project North, which ran from 1975 to 87. Paul's chapter represents the Métis perspective on self-determination, religion, and the importance of pilgrimages to sites like Lac St. Anne. These pilgrimages help maintain Métis identity and are not adequately, adequately described by Western notions of religion and spirituality. This shows why the Declaration's affirmations of the rights of self-determination and to maintain, protect, and have access to their religious sites are significant for Métis people. Hiran Kim Craig is now Timothy Eaton Memorial Church Professor of Preaching at Emmanuel College, Toronto. Her chapter looks at rituals, how these help sustain Indigenous people's identity, and how Indigenous Christians are developing hybrid forms and practices of worship. My chapter looks at how justification by grace can be a spiritual resource for white settlers in the United Church as it seeks to live out its commitment to the Declaration. Jennifer Jansen Ball is now Program Coordinator, Ministry of Vocations in the United Church. Her chapter first problematizes the notion of the common good in light of the history of colonialism in Canada, and then relates a revised version of this to the Declaration. The final chapter by Itiskawewak i Wichiwitochik, Women Walking Together, provides a concrete study of an Indigenous woman's attempt to get justice for her murdered daughter, and then discusses the declaration in light of this. The book ends with an afterword by Sackage Henderson and myself. I wish now to offer a few reflections on the declaration's relationship to Christian theology and where a theological response to it might go next. The TRC called upon Canadian churches involved in the running of residential schools to commit to the declaration as a framework for reconciliation. When invoked in this way, the declaration articulates a demand arising from the legacy of residential schools and the history of indigenous oppression by settler colonialism in Canada. 
This demand is for a recognition of the inherent dignity of indigenous, indigenous peoples, the inherent worth of their cultures and traditions, the oppression they have been subjected to, and the need to rectify the injustices they continue to suffer. This demand comes as an interruption to Canadian churches and to broader Canadian society. It requires an end to ongoing settler colonialism, colonialism and a recognition of and engagement with Indigenous histories, traditions, and wisdom. The term interruption has been used to describe how the Holocaust impacted Christian theology and practice with the demand for engagement with its concrete history. And then in light of this engagement, a dialectical rereading of the biblical witness and Christian traditions. This rereading required first a negation of all that lent support and paved the way for the Holocaust. It also continues to require, as well as that, following this, a retrieval that reads the biblical witness and Christian traditions in light of this history of suffering and looks for resources within these that will help Christians understand and live their faith differently so that it engenders resistance and hope in the face of such evils. Such engagement and rereading continues to cherish the Christian scriptures as a charter document of liberation, but it recognizes that these cannot be cherished and read as before. The legacy of residential schools and settler colonialism necessitates a similar interruption. The declaration articulates the demand for this. It requires a concrete engagement with the history of colonialism in Canada and its continuation in the present and with the involvement of Christian theology and practice in this. This engagement must be followed by a rereading of scripture in light of it that searches for what can empower and guide Christians in seeking to recognize the dignity of Indigenous peoples, the worth of their traditions, and their collective rights. Honoring the Declaration is an initial response from one theological community and collaborators and from one region of Canada. Christian theology has its own subject matter. But in Canada, henceforth, this subject matter must be pursued in light of the demand articulated in the UN Declaration. The afterword to honoring the Declaration raises two questions in this regard. The Declaration provides principles that can guide Canadian churches and settler Canadians towards just and peaceable relations with Indigenous peoples. But how will these principles be interpreted? Will they be softened so that they fit with the Canadian status quo? What will help to interpret them rigorously? And if they are interpreted rigorously, rigorously what will enable people to follow them? As Sackage Henderson noted, despite its best intentions, the declaration is not self-fulfilling. It requires determined commitment and collaboration on the part of individuals and institutions to maximize its promise and potential. As an aid to this, and as a way of gaining a new self-understanding of Christian faith in the light of the Declaration, I think as a white settler Christian, that the Sermon on the Mount should be brought into the conversation. There are several reasons for this. First, one of the sermon's injunctions is that if we have wronged someone, we should act immediately to be reconciled with them. But the sermon doesn't tell us how to do that. It needs the guidance that the Declaration offers. Conversely, following this guidance that the Declaration offers will require the motivation that the sermon provides. The Declaration and the sermon each need what the other offers. Second, the Declaration needs to find proper legal expression through Canadian law and social practices being brought into line with it. But legal measures will only go so far. These are necessary. But the sermon calls for an interior transformation, for, as they say, the unsettling of the settler within. The Declaration requires a similar interior transformation. 
Bringing the sermon into dialogue with it could help make this explicit. Third, the sermon provides motivation for adhering to the Declaration's principles. It also calls for a rigorous understanding of these that will require structural changes in Canadian society. The sermon could be called a fragment that can shatter the reigning totality system of settler colonialism in Canada through its excessive demands for recognition of others and self-withdrawal for their sake. Fourth, white settler Christians will read the sermon differently if we read it in light of the declaration and the current, current debate about its meaning and implementation. The declaration's affirmation of the inherent dignity of Indigenous peoples and the inherent worth of their traditions can profoundly decenter our reading of the sermon. It requires that we understand the sermon's beatitudes and injunctions dialogically and contextually in the shadow of colonialism and with the hope of ending it. White settler Christians need to bring the sermon into conversation with the declaration so that we come to understand the sermon and our calling and identity as Christians differently. There are many ways to respond theologically to the interruption the declaration brings to white settler Christians in Canada. This is just one proposal. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Don. That was much shorter than 40 minutes. <laughs> So I invite everyone, if you feel comfortable, putting your cameras back on, and we will lead in a short discussion or conversation, because we still have lots of time, and uh, but we also don't have to take up all the time either. So please take a moment to come back. I'd be very, uh, be very grateful for that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Don. It was really excellent. So, is there any questions right now? from our uh from the floor or the uh, the zoom floor or any comments please i invite them mm <laughs> Maybe something that'll be more uh, useful too is that in the top right corner, you can click on the view finder and put it into gallery view. And that way you can see everyone who's in the room. Hi, Don, uh, this is Michael. Um, thanks for your presentation today. This book sounds really, really interesting. Um, I belong to a different Christian church body in Canada. And so I'm a little bit out of the loop uh, wondering if if you'd be willing, just real briefly, um, are there some claims against the United Church, some legal claims related to residential schools, or have those been mostly resolved and dealt with? I'm just just getting an update on some information there. So, um, the the legal claims, the United Church was party to the the settlement, uh, overarching settlement, uh, and and it um, paid up you know, the money, et cetera. Uh, so to that extent, legal claims are done, but then there were there are other commitments uh, to which it's now following through. So there are no, at this moment, uh, outstanding legal claims that I know of against the United Church. Uh, Thanks, yeah. And again, I, I'm a little bit out of the loop on some of those details, but, uh, but yeah, appreciate uh, the questions raised and really intrigued by your suggestion about the Sermon on the Mount. I, yeah, really interested to think, think a little bit about what that looks like, particularly as you say, when it gets sort of resituated in this reconciliation conversation. Yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you. Ms. David. 
<laughs> he seems <too> urgent. <laughs> Sorry, just adjusting my screen there. Yeah. Uh, Don, I thought um, I thought the parallel to the interruption um, around the um, the rethinking of Christian claims, um, theology, um, ways of practice, etc., uh, that um, were inspired by an attempt to, I guess, reconcile the church with the, the historical event of the Holocaust and the role of the Christian preaching of contempt towards Jews. However, uh, you know, as well as I do, that history is not um, unambiguous, that uh, for a lot of Christians, uh, business just went on as usual. Mm. And uh, so, um, I mean, there, there's, uh, I would say, a significant minority uh, in the churches that uh, responded, uh, but um, uh, an awful lot that didn't. Uh, I mean, what do you foresee in this, um, in this instance? Uh, well, unfortunately, um, I think you're absolutely right. And, and the same thing is happening. Um, uh, what I see in, in the United Church and in some Anglican congregations is, is that the, the church is, is not moving uniformly at the same speed. Um, for instance, I had a student at, um, I'm going to say Wabagoon, North Ontario, um, serving an Anglo -Cong Anglican congregation. It was, it was in that vicinity, if not Wabagoon. Uh, and, and this was four or five years ago, and, and they were, had integrated um, significant Indigenous practices into their regular Sunday worship simply because um, over half the congregation was Indigenous. Uh, half, half was settlers, half Indigenous. And, and so, you know, they're uh, moving in a direction and at a speed uh, that say the congregation I'm not, where, where, where the big move to date has been um, a land acknowledgement, treaty acknowledgement at the start of worship. I, I do think you're right that, that um, there's, there's a, you know, the United Church, uh, often in some ways on, on this kind of issue mirrors the larger white population across Canada outside of Quebec. Uh, and there's a significant lag there. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a big push in clergy training. Uh, if you go to the United Church, if you access the most recent 2021 issue of the manual. As you read through it, you get to page 10 and there's a major statement about um, uh, kind of repenting and uh, trying to turn around on uh, our involvement in colonialism and residential schools. So, um, you know, it, it's moving at different speeds. There, there is, as you say, a big lag. Um, in some ways, I'm I'm heartened uh, by at least the land acknowledgements uh, being made in at the start of many church gatherings, worship services, uh, meetings. Um, but uh, it it it's a big yeah, a big issue. And, um, you know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I got it. You know, one of the, the places where uh, there might be uh, trouble in uptake uh, is um, in, um, in congregations where there's a large immigrant population. Um, you know, uh, it, it seems to me that um, for, for a lot of immigrants, and you know, I'm a child of, uh, of an immigrant and a refugee, um, and, and so I've, I've heard this often uh, when it comes to this issue, you know, we weren't here for this. You know, we, we, we didn't participate in it. We weren't part of the, uh, this all happened before we arrived. Uh, we are a small marginalized group now. Um, we, we don't, 
um, if we don't take, um, I'm looking for the right words here, uh, it's not our responsibility. Uh, are, did any of the chapters deal with that issue of, um, you know, uh, I guess different, I mean, first it plugs into two issues. One is the immigrant uh, issue and recently and revived arrived issue, but it plugs into that larger question that there are uh, different levels of culpability and participation um, in, in this whole question and therefore uh, different uh, levels of responsibility uh, that people might feel or that people might actually have. So I guess those are two interrelated questions. Yeah, no, I don't. Um, and Christine or Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I don't re recall that being directly addressed in any of the chapters in the book we did. However, in the recent book, Pathways to Reconciliation from University of Manitoba Press, there's a chapter on that, um, which, which calls for, uh, you know, immigrant communities to, to build relationships and get into dialogue with Indigenous communities. Uh, and in my own work, uh, at, at this point in time, probably for the past 10 years and into the immediate future, a, lar a significant number of clergy from the Caribbean, some African countries and parts of Asia are coming into the United Church of Canada. And, and I worked with some of these. And, and I remember some conversations where precisely what you're, you know, you've su suggested is mentioned and stated, you know, this, this isn't our issue. Uh, and in my own work there, uh, I, I've tried to stress um, not all, I think the saying was not all are guilty, but all are responsible. You know, that in this project of Canada, uh, as you move in and, and take this in, uh, you, you take on uh, the responsibilities that we all have. And the, you know, the government has um, in, in the new citizenship oath, there's sections on this, I'm, I'm led to believe, uh, uh, you know. So, but it is a problem, uh, you know, that we didn't do it. We've got our own issues, building our own new lives here and putting up with white majorities. <laughs> so, and what was the second question there? Sorry, let me unmute. Uh, it was related to that, that, um, um, you know, that there are different levels of uh, culpability and different levels of, um, therefore, moral responsibility. And I, I think you've uh, addressed that. Uh, um, you know, as Gregory Baum, mentor to both of us, uh, used to say that when you immigrate to a country, you step onto a moving train. And, you know, it has its own direction and velocity and, uh, you are, you know, you benefit from that uh, society. You benefit from its its uh, its history, its structure, uh, its culture, and uh, and you participate in it. And therefore, you do have a level of moral responsibility. Though, you know, we can't ask the same kind of moral responsibility from, you know, the United Church of Canada and a, uh, you know, a, a spiritual Baptist church that caters to a um, you know, a small group of uh, recently arrived immigrants and refugees from, uh, um, you know, uh, from uh, the Caribbean, for example. So. Thank you, David. Anyway, you um, have other questions? I'll... So we have two other people, Denise and Christine. But um, Don, did you want to respond or? No, that's good. I agree with what he said. Yeah, absolutely. I like the moving train thing a lot. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Denise? Okay, thank you for this book. I think it's really important. Um, the only reason I'm kind of frowning is um, I've attempted to do some education uh, at a, a congregational level of some United Churches here in Victoria. And people, this is like around land back calls to action because they people wanted calls to action after the discovery of the, um, of the graves um, this summer. 
Um, but I find there's this, uh, of course, there's a whole thing of church maintenance, the progressive ministers. So it's not like, I mean, I'm sure I've got, I'm going to send this book immediately to the ministers. They're going to read them. I still think there's a structural problem within the United Church, and I'm also a Catholic, so I, I won't even go there, except there's even a larger immigrant population. So I just want to um, shout out that Paul, I gather, was part of a, this diocese in Victoria, took the University of Alberta's course that uh, Paul was part of, and I just think, oh my God, there's hope at least. But I'm really concerned about structural racism and white supremacy in these churches, because the ones I go to or see here are white, usually older white people. And I, I, I don't think until we attack um, white supremacy in the, in, in the churches, we're going to be able to move beyond conceptual understandings of reconciliation and and the UN declaration it's still in everybody's head so so that's just my thoughts though I think the book's really important as I said I'm going to promote it totally thank you thank you Denise Don uh, well uh, I agree you know the United Church in 2006 declared itself an intercultural church uh, and and part of that um, is a kind of move beyond being a white church. Uh, and that a recent general council, I can't remember exactly which year, uh, but at the end, there was an eruption. Uh, the order of proceedings was disrupted as uh, speaker after speaker of people of color came to the mic and talked about their experiences of racism in the United Church. Uh, and how to affect the change in that, um, you know, at, 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 at all the levels in, in the church is, is, is a big issue. It, it's, it's a voluntary association, you know, if, People don't have to come, you know, it, it's not quite like, you know, what can be enforced. But that aside, their, their congregations, churches can, can make tre tremendous strides. You know, I went into, Leslie and I went into a congregation that was adamantly homophobic. Mm. And uh, after 10 years, we left and uh, they got an interim minister. I think he came after we left, uh, who every Sunday in, at some point in the service would announce that he was gay. <laughs> he did it every Sunday. Mm. Uh, and, and then they, they, they called someone who was there for about five years. And then after being there for five years, um, came out in a sermon. And it, it was no surprise to, the, to most of the congregation. Uh, so, so I think they, they can change. They have to change. Uh, and, and for those of us in various forms of leadership in the United Church, we, we have to find the ways to, uh, to help that to happen. And I, I think, you know, there, there's a kind of twofold way. One's a very blunt strategy. This is racism. It's wrong. It's got to go. Uh, you know, and, and the other uh, was by Martin Buber, who, who says, well, when you run into this, you have to walk with the person into their underlying convictions and find the point where their underlying convictions clash with this kind of behavior and outlook and, and, and and you know, lead them to that, unearth that, explore it, and and, and it that will help it unravel on its own. So. 
Thank you, Don. You brought Boober to the conversation. That's great. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you, Denise. Um, yeah, I think it, just to give a little word, it's uh, every step forward is a step forward, right? So, yeah. And so, Christine? Yeah, thank you. Oh, I got get my microphone there. Sorry. Thank you. And uh, uh, I just want to pick up on... Um, on what Don said in terms of the United Church as kind of a mirror of broader Canadian societal efforts. And, and so in my chapter, one of the things I did was um, is make a call to other biblical, I'm a biblical scholar. Uh, so make a call to uh, biblical scholars, particularly those who teach in um, public universities or secular contexts that um, that the role of the Bible underpinning Canadian law and Canadian society is something that as a guild, a broader guild in broader Canadian society, we have to we have to um, have to problematize and 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 teach our students about that. Um, if you're teaching biblical studies or ancient studies where the Bible is, is part of the curriculum um, and you don't talk about how it, how biblical narratives underpin the, the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius, then you're not doing your job as a biblical scholar, regardless of whether you're in the church or not. And um or synagogue and not and um and I, th I think that's part of the I mean that was something that I find really important as a biblical scholar because uh so many of my colleagues do teach in and work in public university contexts and it's just so important that you cannot um the church isn't going to change if society doesn't change as well. And who leads who in this? It's a bit of a, you know, maybe it's a, a horse and, a, and an ox and they're, they're going at different rates and, and who's pulling who. It's different times, it's not clear, but, um, but both have to pull together. And, and in terms of uh, particularly uh, as being a biblical scholar, that, that's really important. So. What, that was a comment more than a question. <laughs> so there we go. Thank you. Do you have a question, though, Christine? <laughs> that was a great comment and a great chapter, I must say, too, about like uh, unpacking this discourse that leads to uh, to a furtherment of oppression in general society, right? So that's very brilliant. Uh, um, great chapter, right? To well, pushing yeah, that. thank you. And I mean, that's the thing about being a biblical scholar is that whether you whether people are professing Christians or Jews or not, because I'm a Hebrew Bible scholar, whether people are professing Christians or observant Jews or not, the the narratives uh, and the legal material of the texts that I study um, are so fundamental to the entire structuring of the society that you live in a Christianized society, whether you're a professing Christian or not. And, um, and understanding that is, is really important. Um, and it can't be left, you know, the, the work for biblical scholars, the work can't be left to the church because the church is only gonna reach a really small fraction of the people who need to get reached <laughs> in terms of the underpinnings, the, the biblical underpinnings of, um, of so much that is colonial and oppressive um, in Canadian structures and society and religious practices and discourse and ideology and everything else. So yeah, I, I do have strong feelings on this. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I just want to say that is fabulous, absolutely fabulous, because my interest is law right now and Indigenous law, and I'm going to read that chapter, and my son's working on Section 43, which is, you know, disciplining kids with corporal punishment. Important, important chapter. Just fabulous. I'm just so excited. Thank you that 
this book is offering that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes, thank you, Denise and Christine. Um, we have 10 minutes left. Is there any uh, co uh, conversation piece or question that you have in your heart that you want to give to Don, our guest? So Don, maybe, oh yeah, go Chris, Chris Miller. Sorry, uh, thank you uh, for, for sharing. And Don or other contributors who are here, something you mentioned at the beginning, can you speak a little more to the, the kind of process of unsettling in, in making an academic book, uh, whether that's you know your research, your writing, or like taking it to a publisher and how that kind of intersects with decolonialism and colonial structures, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear. Well, um, yeah, you know, you, you come into this, I came into this as, as a white settler who's been, you know, tracking, you know, the Oka summer was a wake up call to me and uh, started, you know, trying to track and read. Uh, but then indigenous literature exploded uh, and I, I got left behind. So on, on the decolonizing, uh, you know, first of all, we started with goodwill. We're gonna, we're gonna produce an academic resource. And then, you know, there was a major correction. Uh, this isn't something that settlers should try to do on their own. We, we've got to get indigenous partners. Uh, and, and that profoundly changed uh, many aspects of the project. Uh, I was horrified in, during the symposium when the idea of an editor was rejected. I mean, <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I've, I've been involved in the production of a few books and, and someone's got to take out the garbage. Uh, and, and um, but it, um, it was the right way to go. Uh, and, and in the, in the uh, forward, Paul and I talk about a bit about the ambiguity that um, we were timekeepers, but there were some editorial decisions we just had to make. Uh, and, and as we were involved, you know, the whole debate about the title, for instance, um, I really had to um, watch how I participated in that. As, as a white settler, you know, it was, um, th there's a time to, uh, to listen. Uh, and the, uh, then, you know, there were, the indigenous community isn't moving at the same speed, you know, the, and so there were the folks at University of Regina Press saying one thing and we were saying another. <laughs> Uh, but it all it, it worked out and uh, we listened to them and, and they listened to us more or less and um, <laughs> uh, um, so it was it was quite a process and, and um, uh, but not one to be entered into lightly and um, yeah uh, and and if, if you're a white settler coming into this a settler period you have to know when to listen and when to change directions somehow. So. Mm -hmm. I, I might just add in terms of process, um, this took five years. Yeah. Right? Like uh, from the time, like the, the first <laughs> conversations that folks had about it, I was on sabbatical. I came back from sabbatical um, um, for the fall of 2016. And I came back to the conversation had just started. And so that was 2016 and the book came out in the fall of 2021. So, you know, it, it takes now part of that was there ended up being some delays on the publishing end, but that might have only account for about a year of it. Uh, so even, you know, if everything had gone 
ideally, sorry, my cat is screaming in the background, if you can hear that. Um, but even if everything had gone ideally, it still would have been a four year process. And, and you know what they say about any kind of edited volume that um, or collected volume is, you know, the, the, the amount of just because you, you bring in the people with all the different expertise and, and that's great and everything, it doesn't save you any time. <laughs> uh, you, 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 you know, if you just wrote, wrote the book yourself. So, um, so if people were thinking about doing some kind of collective work um, in a department or a faculty or something like that, then um, I would say logistically be prepared for it to chew up a lot of time. And you can't get away from it the way that you do when you're doing collaborative projects outside your institution, right? Because then you got to go to a faculty meeting the next day and, you know, talk about, you know, course offerings for next year or whatever. So, uh, so there's that. Uh, so there's those kinds of pieces as well to, to think about. Yeah. And um, let me just add too, is that we were deliberately situating our work and our relations in, in Treaty 6. And we deliberately took the U of R press as a prairie press. And I feel everyone, uh, it took long, but the collaborative nature of being from the prairies in the prairies and in treaty relations in treaty six and Métis homeland i feel like we were very responsive and um very uh very giving to to this whole process um because it was really like when we had questions around the title it went out onto an email loop and came back really positively and like people responded and there was no no bs which is very good that's a that's a that's a term that never happened for us. You know, there was no BS with us. It was really fun, and so and I think that's the spirit of me and Don working together as, you know, trying to bring these things together in a fun and and joyful way. I think Don and I have been very joyful throughout our whole our whole relationship together as co-editors or not editors, timekeepers. There, yeah. Um, Paul is very good to put up with me, <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> Who am I? Just a minty kid who comes into this whole thing. What the hell? Um, David, I think, uh, did you want to have a one last question? before? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Um, uh, the, um, uh, Don, you, you mentioned that the United Church declared itself an intracultural church. Um, and at that time, did it wrestle with, or has it since wrestled with the issue of reconciliation? You know, I mean, there, there are two issues. One, uh, you know, Indigenous people in Canada do, do not want to be classified as a, you know, a minority, a cultural minority, the way that the Ukrainians uh, or Korean, uh, Korean Canadians are. Um, so that's one issue. Mm -hmm. uh, however, without dealing with reconciliation, um, multiculturalism or interculturalism can, can simply be a vehicle for inviting immigrants to participate in and fortify the colonial settler project. So has that kind of critical consciousness uh, been applied or kind of critical questioning been applied to the church's stance on interculturalism? Um, gradually, um, the, the church declared itself an intercultural church without doing a lot of work on what that meant. Uh, it, it, if you read the minutes of the record proceedings, the reports in around that, um, they're a little vague. You know, it, it definitely means a decentering of whiteness. Um, and, you know, there's Francophones, they don't see themselves as one ethnic community amongst the many. Uh, and, and neither do Indigenous peoples. And, and those are, are, are two realities that uh, some in the United Church have struggled to lift up. As we're becoming intercultural, there also has to be uh, a recognition of the specific status of these groups. So, so the United Church is, is uh, and, and as Denise put, pointed out, um, the United Church is walking um, uh, 
a kind of two street path here between becoming intercultural and seeking reconciliation uh, with indigenous peoples. Uh, and when I say it's walking that it's some parts of it are, as Denise pointed out, some parts of it aren't really moving much uh, or sufficiently yet. Um, and, and so there is uh, a lot of work to be done practically and theologically uh, a, a, a around these, these issues. And, and the, um, you know, there is a kind of sense that um, the Francophone constituency in the United Church and in Canada has slipped off the United Church's radar screen at the moment. Um, you know, it was there after the FLQ crisis big time, and there was a visiting team, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but, but they've been kind of pushed off by these other things. Good, thanks, Don. Good. Welcome, Emily. <laughs> Emily, Emily snuck in at the end. That's really good. Um, so I would like to take an opportunity to, uh, and everyone should thank uh, Don for uh, doing a great presentation and doing lots of fun and hard work, um, making uh, making good changes in our institutions, which is really fun. So uh, I don't have any news for the next webinars on me right now, but please stay tuned to your CSSR um MailChimp thing that comes in to see for the next uh, great uh, presentation. Oh, I think, oh, actually, uh, in at the end of January, early February, we're going to be doing our presidential address, and which comes in a little late because of COVID and all this, and all this weirdness. And uh, we'll be doing our book uh, prize winners uh, uh, and uh, essay prize winners from this last year. Good. So I want to thank Don again, and thank you so much for coming in and uh, having a great conversation about this. This is fantastic. Marcy, hi, hi, everyone, and have a good evening. Bye.